Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It all depends where you are. Um, first of all, I would like to welcome everyone who is here today for our online talks program. My name is Emir Fall and I'm the founder of the art organization, The Sero Project. Um, many of you might not know what is The Sero Project, as I will try to share a little bit of our story. So the idea of Sero started in 2010 when I was researching about indigenous art in Australia for my MA uh, in curatorial studies. But it was only in 2016 when I actually moved to UK that I create this, I, I materialize it as a curatorial project. And today, almost 10 years after um, of being in Australia, Zero Cross is an organization now um, for the promotion and exhibition of contemporary art that falls outside of Eurocentric and Western narratives, where we develop, curate, and collaborate on curatorial projects, exhibitions, and events across the world. Our aim is to encourage critical engagement with uh, artists, curators, critics, collectors, scientists, writers, anyone um, that aims to collaborate with us. And we are always wishing uh, and inviting people to think differently about art, globalization, and our relation with the world around us. Currently, uh, we are having a, an art program here in Portugal which we call Ventsum, and is a collaboration with our partner in Portugal, which we can see here in my back, the space that we are holding now an exhibition. And Ventsum, uh, many people don't know what it means, it means solar winds. And in Portugal, when this wind actually blows on our coast, it creates kind of a storm and agitation and we chose this name just to create kind of an analogy uh, where we hope um, to work with artists and curators and people from different parts of the world. And uh, so we can kind of shape the local art scene, but also inspire other shores around the world. Um, today, the reason why we are here is because I'm collaborating with the artist Ekvenia Emmons uh, in a long-term art project, which we call Say my name and I will tell you my story, which is also part of this Ventus Loop program, where we aim to rethink stories, memories, narratives about eucalyptus trees here in Portugal, as well in the Western world and to indigenous cultures. This project will have different phases of engagement and outcomes, including exhibitions, which we have one here on the back, some installations, gastronomic experience, and more important, we hope that this project bridges people from different backgrounds and knowledge and life experience to collaborate with us and make our project also part of theirs. Because only with true collaborations where people immerse themselves in what they believe that we can actually generate some change in the world that we all have to learn to respect and protect for the future generations. Thank you, Inesh, for such a beautiful introduction. I will continue. My name is Evgenia Emmets. I'm an artist, and um, I would love to share with you a little bit about the work that I have prepared in the framework of this project. So in this project, uh, say my name and I will tell you my story. The protagonist and the centerpiece of, the, of this work is Eucalyptus Tree. And I have developed a special relationship with this tree here in Portugal since um, three years, since I have been observing the ecological scene and the cultural scene here, and since I've been working with forests. And all the artistic work has been done for this project in a very intuitive way, uh, using natural materials that the tree has to offer uh, in quite in quite organic way. It's all from the forest, the eucalyptus leaves and the bark from the tree. And I'm printing directly with these materials on fabric. And I believe that through this, the eucalyptus tree or the gum tree, as these trees are called in Australia, where they come from, they gain the voice and they express their own messages in their own way and open for us humans a possibility to ask them questions to collaborate with them, to co-create with them and um, tell an alternative story that is emerging. 
And we are hoping um, to create a holistic perspective on this tree, which um, these trees, they exist in abundance in this country in Portugal because of the widespread use in monoculture plantations for paper production and a series of quite controversial socio-cultural relationships that's been developed over the years. Through our series of conversations, um, we believe that there is a possibility to embrace the presence of these trees here and uh, to really look closely at their purpose of being in this country in a wider cultural sense while integrating newly emerging wisdom from research, science, but also traditional Aboriginal knowledge in Australia, where these trees are originally from. We hope that you enjoy this exhibition at the Spacios Peleoagua, which is still on until the 6th of November in Lisbon, our online exhibition experience, but also the series of conversations that we are holding online with our wonderful speakers. My name is Evgenia Emmets, and I would like to start by actually giving a word to Ines Valle and to ask her to introduce herself and the project. So hi everyone, um, it's exciting that all of you are here. I think we've got almost like, I don't know, 60 or 70 people um, present. So, so uh, this project is um, part of the cultural program that we have here in Portugal uh, from the organization which I run, which is called Cero Project. Um, and Cero Project, the aim is to promote um, and exhibit contemporary art that falls outside Eurocentric and Western narratives. Um, and to develop and curate and collaborate on cultural projects uh, across the world. And we always aim to encourage critical engagement uh, with global issues, to foster dialogue between artists, curators, writers, scientists, and collectors. And we hope to invite everyone to think differently about art globalization and our relationship with the world around us. Um, and now I'm passing the word to Egbenia and she will speak about the project that we have here now, which is called Say My Name and I will tell you my story. Hello everybody and welcome to this uh, beautiful gathering online. My name is Evgenia Emitz, I'm an artist, I'm a poet, I live in Portugal, I'm based here right now, and my work is related to forest ecology and connecting us, all of us, to, yeah, to the space of the forest, to the time and dimension of the forest. Um, this project that I'm doing now is also connected with the work I've been doing in Portugal since I moved here three years ago, called Eternal Forest. And it emerged uh, through my work and my collaboration with Ines Valle when we met um, in summer this year. It felt like a natural, uh, natural fit to work together, to collaborate. Um, the project that we are doing right now, say my name and I will tell you my story, is uh, focused and is centered around the voice of eucalyptus tree. Um, but it's not just some kind of eucalyptus trees, it's actually the whole genus, it's called genus, it's not a family, it's a genus of eucalyptus trees. Um, and it's also particularly and especially the eucalyptus tree that we know under the name of um, Tasmanian blue gum, which is uh, eucalyptus globulus. These trees, this specific uh, species of eucalyptus is very widespread all across the world. And there is one very important reason for that. Uh, we humans, we are using this tree extensively for paper production, for pulp. Here in Portugal, in Iberia, in California, in India, and in many other places in the world, very successfully. And what happened is, it's, it's true story. The tree asked uh, me, 
personally to try to help and to communicate a series of messages that it has. They, these trees have to us, they have to deliver. And so this is how the whole story started. Uh, we can unpack a little bit today. We can start unpacking in this conversation and in the next two conversations that are going to hold online in, um, in next week. And today, um, with this project, we are opening um, international online, I would say, communication between us humans, but also including, actively trying to include the trees themselves and their voice into this conversation. Uh, this is an artistic investigation, but it's also a multidisciplinary investigation, and we have invited our beautiful speakers to be part of it today. Uh, today's topic is plant intelligence and plant communication. We feel this topic is incredibly important for many different reasons. Uh, we have seen recently that science really have caught up with this topic that's been a little bit exoteric and obscure. And so today we, have, we're, we are going to open it from two very different perspectives, from which actually overlap quite a lot from the scientific perspective, but also from a very, um, including the scientific method, but also including deep listening and intuitive listening, which I don't want to say they're exclusive, they're actually inclusive. And I think today we're going to, to see that. Today's talk uh, is recorded like all talks. So just it's, it's, a, it's a small warning. And um, I hope you don't mind. If you really mind, then you can just um, take a video down and it will be just your name on the screen. And with this, I would like to introduce further three participants um, uh, who we have here. And you will understand why three. So first participant is Monica Gagliano. She is present here with us. And I'm not going into a long technical pres academic presentation. I'm just going to say what I feel from my heart and how I really relate to her work and her research. I came across Monica's book last year when I went for a walk with somebody called Filipa Heitor, who is based in Portugal and she does walks in uh, Sintra. Inesh is just showing Monica's book. Inesh, can you show the book once again? And Philippa told me, Evgenia, with your work, you must read Monica's book, which I did. And when I read the book, I thought, my God, this is really mind blowing. This is really, I must go deeper. And I wanted to contact Monica straight away, but I didn't do it because I felt like, well, she's super busy. I just cannot take her time. I need to find a good reason to do that. So this reason is what we're having today. I feel that Monica's work is truly wide opening, eye opening and uh, groundbreaking. And we're going to see why you must read the book. It's, 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 it's a real delight. It's written in the language that I don't think many scientific books are written. It's incredibly, um, it's beautiful, it's inspiring. And it also shows all the steps that she has um, all the, all the steps of the journey that she has done uh, along the way. And it really allows us to see that we must open our ears and our eyes and start listening deeply. And we need to find new ways of listening. We also have Sarah Abbott here with us. Um, we met in the conference Evolving the Forest in the UK um, two summers ago. And I helped her to facilitate her talk. I was there sitting behind the computer. And at that moment, her talk about plant communication entered my mind, but I didn't really have a chance to explore it deeper. But now she's here with us and I'm incredibly excited that we are in the same room together. Uh, she has done over the years a lot of work connecting with indigenous people, connecting with people who do communicate with plants, who do listen to plants and who do hear the voice of the trees and the plants. And she has combined it in her academic research, in her filmmaking, in her ethnographic research, and today she is going to share this with us. 
I just wanted to say that I'm incredibly grateful to both Sarah and Monica because they're based on very different opposite sides of the world and there's a lot of time that separates them, this kind of strange, you know, it, it's it's real thing. Sarah is in Canada and Monica is in Australia right now and we are in Portugal. And there is one more participant that I'm going to introduce. And I'm going to start by introducing this participant by uh, playing you a poem. It is the eucalyptus tree. And so the poem is written by Alexandra Falim, who is also mother of Ines Falim. And she wrote this poem and she shared it with us. And we felt it's a really nice first intro we can make to the tree. So here we go. I hope you can all listen to it. Okay, so somebody is telling me the video is low and is not playing. You cannot hear anything. Okay, you cannot hear anything. So it is on 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 total. Uh, let me try some. Sorry about that. Let's try now again. I find this pit dug in bare rock. Next to it, a flourishing ancient eucalyptus. Beautiful tree with a rough and strong trunk with scars of darkness light history. He is supported by roots sinking deep in soil, looking for water, nourishment, silence. And his canopy, all oh, that one, covered with grand leaves, eagerly lifts his arms spread out into sunlight. And just like this eucalyptus, so will I in pure water quench my thirst, drinking through the roots that feed me this life that gets me to the immense sky which in remembrance I tenderly kiss. Then, stroking even the clouds with my arms, I praise the essence that my sap carries. Mm. Yeah, I would like to thank Alessandra and I would like to thank Inesh for, for bringing this forth. And I would love to just say before we start the actual conversation that we feel um, that it's a very, very timely moment to um, really go deeper into not just talking about plants and trees in a different way, not just finding the language to um, talk about them, but also perhaps open that door which leads us to a possibility of 
finding the language of hearing and perhaps communicating with that other than human or non-human and why not? Why not now and why not us? And perhaps there is something there that could be part of the solutions that we're all seeking so desperately together as human society. Could we bring them on board to be part of our society? And could we step into their realm to become part of their space? And maybe these are not two separate realms. So this is just something I wanted to offer. And I would love to invite Inesh perhaps to make a first question to our guests. Um, so I would like to ask um, to both of you, um, what have been, what, what have you learned through your experience, work and research about the voice of the other, the plant, the tree, and how you can allow this voice to come true. Yes, Monica. And Sarah. I was actually saying, off you go, Sarah, up to you. <laughs> okay, because you gestured first, I was thinking for you, but okay. Um, so thank you, Evgenia and Inesh and Monica for joining us. Um, I just want to really acknowledge all the work that you've put into the show and these online conversations and the way that you're really thinking about trees and forest and it's, a, it's in a very deep way and I really appreciate it. I have appreciated so far our conversations. Um, and what I love about these conversations is that it enriches my own thinking and understanding. And I suppose that's also part of the ethno ethnographic approach that I've taken, um, which is social science. And it's based in um, a qualitative understanding of um, relationships with trees, um, observations, interviews. I've interviewed um, tree knowers and hope to move into interviewing trees, but I haven't gotten quite that far except for having connections and communications with them. Um, and participated in interspecies communication workshops and uh, giving talks on trees to share my research. And um, often people will share things that they know about trees, which I find so um, interesting and inspiring. And then also making a film. So the interviews that I did are all recorded on film. Um, and including in, in my understanding plant science and philosophies, um, about the non-human from the non-human turn and ontological turn that's happening in academia now and has been for a few decades. Also um, involved, and that's so ethnography is the study and representation of culture. And usually it's human-based, um, like so many things, too many things. Um, also, I've been working with indigenous uh, research methodologies. Um, I've been um, connecting with Indigenous um, culture and issues for almost 20 years, and it just seemed a natural, obvious thing for me to turn to Indigenous knowledge. And uh, honestly, I also felt that if I didn't, it would be quite rude, um, because this knowledge has been disregarded and has been stolen um, by Western academia for 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 too long. Um, it's part of colonialism. Um, and I turned to Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous science because of its, um, its deep understanding of interrelations between humans and, and non-humans, between humans and the natural world. That knowledge is cumulative over time, cumulative. It's uh, based in respect and reciprocity. And um, 
it's kind of an, a process of, of wisdom and action. I'm quoting Aikenhead and Mitchell there. So there's not an end point. And um, I just felt that the understanding of how to be in, in nature, how to work with trees, how to be with trees, offering tobacco and incorporating protocols like that was really important to understanding um, trees and, and respecting them. And both ethnograph ethnography, well, yeah, most ethnographic practices and indigenous relations, um, indigenous methodologies have a holistic approach. So things are not taken apart and studied um, in parts. And by doing that, it's, it's a more well-rounded understanding of the trees in their, in their environments and their communities and that they are in community. Um, yeah, and I could sort of go on a little bit more, but um, I guess the theories are ontological emergence, which is understanding that things are always emerging uh, and they're alive. Um, because often we don't think of trees and other uh, aspects of nature as alive, like we are because we're so human based. And I also really like the concept of biosocial relations from Tim Ingold and Gisley Paulson. And that is the idea that every being is formed by its um, own biology, but also its relationship, its social relationships in its environment. And um, yeah, as I move in this work, it's been probably about six years now that I've been quite dedicated to it. And it's always a practice to remember that nature has its own perspective and that we, um, we must um, recognize that perspective. And the more that um, that's conscious for me, it, it's a paradigm shift. And my secret hope is that we can all go through that similar kind of paradigm shift um, as a planet because uh, we're in trouble and um, we need to recognize that other beings are in trouble and we share this world with them. Um, so I think that's enough for me. Mm -hmm. And I'll probably end up answering the, you know, how, um, the voice of, of, of trees through the other, other questions. So over to you, Monica. Thank you. Uh, nice to meet everyone. Um, I just would like to acknowledge that I, um, I'm sitting in Vangelan country. Uh, in our aqual nation, which is, in other words, uh, what we call Byron Bay area of the Northern Rivers of Australia. And, uh, and I would like also to acknowledge in the context of this, um, a very terrible loss that happened just a few days ago. This was um, a very big uh, deal because uh, it is a eucalyptus tree um, which was uh, a, on a birthing site, uh, which got cut down after almost, um, well, over a year of protest by the indigenous people of like the nation of that area. And, uh, and it was cut down to make space for a 10 kilometer stretch of road. And this is a sacred site for birthing. And, uh, and I think it's very timely because um, because um, this kind of action represents exactly where the paradigm, where the, so our society, so-called, um, is at. We, are, we talk about giving uh, rights to nature, caring for nature, uh, being more mindful about our relationship with nature. And then uh, a 500, maybe 800 years old tree, which has seen many, many humans being born under its canopy, um, getting cut down so that they can pull a road 10 kilometers. They could have turned the road somewhere else, but no, that, and in a way, this is, um, this is a criminal act. I think it should be called for what it is, uh, because it's not only uh, killing a being that has been there for uh, more than we can remember uh, as a culture, um, but also it's uh, yet another um, absolutely uh, attack on indigeneity, um, both for indigenous people and for all of us, because 
you know, we are all indigenous of this place. This, there is only one place. So the loss of a tree of that kind and the loss of, uh, of the links to the memory that that tree has hold, it's, um, it's a loss for everyone. So, um, hmm. I cannot remember the questions. <laughs> I was so immersed into Cyrus sharing that I don't remember what the question was. Inesh, if you want me to answer a question, maybe you have to ask again. <laughs> Um, okay, so let me ask you again. Um, through from what you have learned through your experience and work and research uh, about the voice of the other, the plant, the trees, um, how can we allow this voice to come through? Hmm. Okay, so again, in the context of this big tree, there was uh, what I think is uh, really missing, which is what uh, it's required in order to en enter into this conversation and the dialogue uh, with uh, these others. Um, and there was no consultation. Nobody asked the tree, you know, these people who decided that we're going to put the road here, they didn't bother, they hardly bothered asking the, you know, the traditional owners of the land, but they definitely didn't, it didn't even come to mind that uh, the tree might have something to say. It's been there for 800 years. It's been seeing so many humans passing by, being born, dying, growing. And um, maybe he had something to say, she had something to say that was useful to us. And instead, uh, we, there was no consultation. And I think that that is an important word because um, uh, consultation uh, is usually, I guess, used in a more legal um, context. And, uh, and that's how all disputes, but also all interaction from a legal perspective start for, I'm not a lawyer, but that's my understanding, my very basic and superficial understanding. So you enter in consultation first to understand who is the other, uh, what are their needs, uh, who, who am I in this context and what are, what are my needs and how I would like them to be met. And, and so this process um, doesn't seem to occur except in very rare cases. For example, maybe we do it with our pets because we see them more like uh, humans. Uh, and, uh, but with the rest of um, the non-human others, we, we seem to forget. And, and of course, it's totally connected with what Sarah just said about not being able to see them. And plants in particular, uh, you know, we talk about the forest. The forest is made by so many organisms, like so many different species, so many different individuals within the same species. And, um, and so I think uh, what um, I have learned is to, uh, and learning, <laughs> like is to enter into this process of consultation. And uh, to do that, I have to let go of the ideas that I have of the other um, so that the other can show itself for what it wants to be and she can be what she needs to be instead of being the idea that I have for it. And um, because when it becomes a it, it already, I already decided exactly uh, what he's got to say. <laughs> and I already decided uh, what, what is the answer to my question. So what is the point? There is no consultation. And uh, in the process of doing that, and I know from the emails that I receive from many people around the world, from all sorts of environments and backgrounds and contexts and ages, uh, it seems like uh, this is not a special thing that some of us do and others don't. And there's nothing special about this. This is actually uh, very much our human beingness to be able to, um, be humans enough, human enough, or and enter enough in our humanity to listen and and be in consultation and conversation with the everyone, everyone around us. But as you know, like we are not very good at being in consultation even between us. So let alone with others. I think it's a deeper, deeper question. But it's so urgent because now everyone around us, humans and not. Uh, are really telling us you must listen. If you want to be here, you must listen. No more this, uh, you know, tantrum for teenagers. 
teenager's time is done, it's over. And now it's time to grow up in a mature adult, which, you know, inspired by a very child heart based um, sense of wonder for what we are and where we are. Uh, but, you know, there are, there are many, many others that are much older and wiser than we are, and we need to recognize them. And, uh, and I think this is really what is required. And exactly as Sarah said, I think for, for many people, this process requires a total dismantling of the preconditioned idea of what we are and what they are. And, um, and sometimes that can be very painful. I'm seeing, we're seeing it everywhere. This is the deconditioning that we're going through. And, uh, and it's very painful to, to let go and be, not know what you're gonna be next. But the, the, the funny thing is that you never know. And, um, and you know, talking about eucalyptus and I'm sure we'll delve into this deeper, but you know, I have uh, obviously been in Australia, I'm surrounded by them and, and there is a really big one just outside my door. And um, these trees, some of them, like the, the one, the river red gums, for example, are well known for dropping their leaves and their, their arms, the, the branches just uh, crack uh, like quite suddenly and unexpectedly. And, um, and they just drop them. And um, there is no questioning whether that's the right thing or not. The tree simply does it because that's what is required. This limb is no longer necessary, I let it go. And, uh, and it's not letting, it's a, it's a dying because of course that limb is done for what, it, what its purpose was in the beginning. But it's also, I guess, uh, a living because uh, that's how the, the tree thrives by letting go and dropping the arms that are no longer required. And, and, um, and I, it sounds like a metaphor because of course it, uh, it would be a beautiful metaphor for our society, but the tree actually does it. It's, in, it's an embodied um, uh, condition or an embodied beingness. And, and in doing that, in engaging with that embodiment, so by dropping the, the, the arm, because that's what you do, uh, the tree is providing spaces and creating opportunity for more and more life. And when the tree doesn't, is not allowed to do that, because the dropping of the arms is not just, oh, now I'm gonna let go of this arm, but the arm stays near the tree and by rotting it provides nutrients and by um, breaking it provides little uh, nook and crannies for other organisms. Uh, the hole that le is left behind is inviting bees to create a home there. So it's, uh, it, it creates more structure, it creates more diversity, it, it creates opportunities. There is more dialogue between many more. And uh, so in that sense, letting go and dropping the arms that no longer serve us, um, it should be seen for what it is, like a, an opportunity for uh, more, more beauty, more diversity, more creative spaces, more life, rather than this drama that we, we're very drama, dramatic humans. <laughs> uh, this drama that we are all gonna be dead is like, uh, if we were gonna all be dead, we will be all dead by now. So just let's get over it. We are here to stay. So let's stay in a good way instead of in a really uncomfortable way. But um, I don't know. I don't know if I answered the question. You see, I wasn't listening to the question in the first place and probably I didn't answer anyway. So, but yeah, that's for me. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Monica. And thank you, Sarah. Um, and Monica, because you started talking about this particular eucalyptus tree and when we spoke first time, you already shared that story a little bit. I would like just to give our participants a little bit of an extra um, kind of extra idea of how this whole story happened for you and how it came about, because I think it's quite a peculiar way, the way you encountered that place, the way you started working with that tree. I think I feel it would be really nice to share with everybody, like how how this, because it, it's a research that you are doing right now. It's the actual um, setting that you work with, with a team of people. So could you share with us a little bit about that? What What's the focus and 
how did the tree call you? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, well, I live in a beautiful place uh, surrounded by forest and uh, uh, but I um, my official position when I moved here was actually in Sydney, in a city, uh, concrete, you know, the usual. Sydney is a beautiful city, amongst many cities. It, Sydney is a beautiful city, but uh, still it wasn't really for me. <laughs> and, uh, and that became very clear very quickly. And so in the process of trying to find a home, uh, I came across this uh, beautiful place but it's actually nine hours drive from Sydney. So it's not really uh, in Sydney. So um, what I did, I asked a friend who was uh, living in the local area to go and see this place for me. And um, he's, um, he's an academic himself, he's, uh, he's uh, a legal theorist and also heavily involved uh, for the Earth Law movement. So he was involved in the uh, drawing of the legislation for the Pachamama rights and all of the um, rights for nature and uh, ecological jurisprudence. So anyway, um, he comes to this place and of course he meets um, the, the owner of the property and the, the, this woman who is now uh, my landlady and also a really good friend shows my friend around and shows the house and this is the kitchen and this is that. And then they go outside in the back and it's like, oh, and then, you know, this will be also part of uh, Monica's space and it's, she's pointing to the forest. And, uh, and naturally they just walk towards this enormous eucalyptus tree who is just in front of the, the, the back door. And, um, and uh, without really uh, agreeing on anything, they just both fell into this uh, deep silence. And so they were standing in front of this beautiful old, now we refer to her as the grandfather tree. And, uh, and they were just both standing in front of this big tree without saying a word. Um, and then after a, a while, they just moved on and she carried on like, oh, and this is the other part of the house. And, and the meeting, finished and of course my friend called me to let me know about the property. She said, Monica, this is perfect for you. It's exactly like I can totally see you here. And not only that, but I can see that this woman is gonna be a really good friend for you. It's just I can feel this. And and by the way, um and he said like, and you know I don't really hear trees um talking to me. But, uh, but the, there was this big tree, like there's this big eucalyptus in the back. It's got this beautiful, shiny, white skin and um, that is, peeled, you know, under the peeling of uh, the darker bark and uh, it's gigantic. And we just, um, we were just standing in front of it and, and I heard something and I was like, oh, really? And for, for him, it's really uh, unusual to say that. So um, he's like, tell me, what, what, what did you hear? And it was like, well, the tree, the tree said like, uh, Monica is coming. <laughs> so I guess this is, this must be your home. Um, so I said, okay, thank you. Uh, then of course, second conversation, I had a conversation with the, my, you know, my landlady uh, to be, and, um, and you know, she's explaining all sorts of things. And then she said, oh, you know, I really enjoyed meeting your friend. And uh, we had this beautiful moment, like we went outside and of course the two of them didn't know that they were sharing with me. So they were doing it independently. Yeah, we had this beautiful moment and we went outside and, and we just fell into this deep silence. And uh, I really had this feeling that there was a conversation going. And I was there like, uh-huh. <laughs> well, I think someone was talking. There was a conversation going. And, and so I shared with her what my friend had experienced. It's like, oh my God, yeah, I can totally, yeah, I can totally recognize that. I, can, I could feel that something was happening, that something was being shared. And um, of course, fast forward almost two years later, I've been living here. We go and say hello to the tree often because uh, he's been telling us that he would like to be, um, you know, like visited a bit more often. So it's like, okay, we got uh, grandfather, grandparents chores to do. And, um, but it gives so much joy because it's such a beautiful presence and there's, yeah, th there would be no way that we could imagine this land without him. And uh, so he's not just a tree. Well, none of them are, but, um, 
they are it feels to me because we live in a place that is so um kind of quite remote from cities uh, from noise. I mean, what I'm hearing from my window right now are the birds waking up because it's early morning here. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, without uh, the space for listening, it becomes really difficult. And we live in very noisy, noisy environments and uh, not just outside, but also in our heads. And I guess uh, by coming here, I was uh, given this beautiful gift of finding myself in a space where I can be in, uh, um, in enough silence, in the depth of the silence can be such that I can actually so easily uh, hear, but also just listen to all of these conversations going on. And sometimes it's actually like, guys, I really don't have time right now, seriously, I've got stuff to do. <laughs> so can we talk about it later? And uh, so these are uh, active participants in our life every day. And, um, and they have been suggesting things that we have implemented on, in the, on the land uh, that uh, needed to be done. And we were just not seeing them. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's right. We should do that <laughs> and, uh, and improve the, you know, the quality of our life here. So... Um, yeah, again, I think I, I keep detouring from the questions, but um, yeah. Well, thank you. I think to continue this conversation, I think I would like to ask both of you as well, how does uh, the language that we use to describe in plants and trees inform our relationship that we have with them and how does it have to does it need to change so we can have a deeper understanding and connection with nature? Okay, my turn. Um, thanks, Monica. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, the language has to change. Um, I've been uh, sitting in a little bit on climate change conversations and so many people will talk about human capital and nat natural capital and I just feel like it's my job now to say no no we can't use that that word like it's it's so inappropriate it just keeps enforcing um, nature as resource for humans um, people usually are a bit shocked um, but you know if we can work to gradually get people to start to think about that differently, I, th I think it would be really important. Um, and even um, something that I think about too is how environmental, like um, environmental sustainability and development is, seems like a good thing, but it's really doesn't include the, the non-humans in the picture because it's based on economics and the well-being of, of humans more than non-humans. Um, and also, um, I made some notes here. That's why I keep looking down because I wanted to share some quotes. Um, and I guess, you know, thinking about language, um, pronouns, um, Timothy Morton writes about how that's, such a, you know, um, contains anthropocentric assumptions. And um, Pantea Armanfar, I don't know if she's on the call with us today, hopefully she is, from Tehran, um, recently wrote um, an article called Life of a Sundu or Sundu of a Life in Plumwood Mountains Journal. And I just thought it was so innovative of her in her written language to use a bullet point in place of it, they, she, and he, so that it disrupts what we don't think about um, because it's so embedded in, in our, the way we, our language is just like the air we breathe. Um, and speaking of the air we breathe, I want to share with you this really great um, quote from um, Iro uh, Iroquois. Um, uh, uh, he's Iroquois and his name is Lauren, I Lauren Lyons. Um, and it's, he, he says, we native people did not have the concept in, of private property in our, in our lexicon. And this is so embedded in our ideology as Western people and our language. And the principle of private property was pretty much in conflict with our value systems. For example, you wouldn't see 
no hunting or no fishing or no trespassing signs in our territories. To a native person, such signs have been equivalent to saying no breathing <laughs> because the air is somebody's private property. If you said to the people, the Ontario government owns all of the air in Ontario. And if you want some, you are going to have to go and see the Bureau of Air. <laughs> and we should all laugh, which we are all doing right now. Um, it made the Indians laugh too when the Europeans said, we are going to own the land. How can anyone own the land? And it's, it's based in that um, Western idea that um, we can take and use and, and not care. And this, this also relates to how we treat each other. You know, um, this is core of racism. Um, there's a wonderful uh, Reverend, Reverend Kyoto um, Williams, of course, I'm getting caught up in trying to find that quote. Um, here it is, Reverend Angel Kyoto Williams, um, a writer, activist and ordained Zen priest um, talks about how we have a willingness to degrade the planet because we have a willingness to degrade each other. It's just, it's just all in there. And then I just also want to um, share another quote that I recently came upon. And it gets, you know, what is language? We think about it as spoken language, but it's, it's also the way we are in the world. Um, and Monica was referring to how the eucalyptus has an embodied, um, embodied way of being with dropping its limbs. Um, that's language too, right? And so this quote um, is a story of a fishing village in, in um, Alaska, an elder from Chevek, which is a Kupik community. And um, they hold the worldview that the environment is responsive to human thought, action, and deed. So all of that is embedded in our language too. It's like, a, it is a social ecological connection. And this is the quote from Cecilia Andrews long ago you know how they used to go out camping. Since they stopped doing that, and since they stopped going to by dog team and where they'd get to, as far as like a whole, as far as like a whole lot of fish, they would catch really lots. Since they don't go, it seems like the fish are more and more scarce and harder to get. So there's this um, language, I think, of of going to the trees, of going to the fish, and the trees and the fish come back. Um, of course, we can also say that there's less fish because of pollution, because of climate effects. But in fact, we're saying the same thing because if people had been going to the, to the natural world, we wouldn't have all this pollution and climate issues. So that's my, my long response to the language question. Um, this is beautiful. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and it reminds me of an experience that I had recently while I was uh, in a, on a field trip. Uh, this was not a eucalyptus, but it could have been. Uh, it could have been any tree, really, or anyone that um, was present. And, um, and one of the things that this uh, big tree said was, um, it invited me to sit. And, and I was like, oh, sorry, I don't have time right now. <laughs> I'm a busy human, you know? <laughs> and, um, and I was with three other people and we were in a group of about 10, but the other people were kind of a little bit, they walked a little bit further ahead and the three, the four of us were kind of left behind. And, and I, as we passed this tree, that's what I heard. And I actually used the language and verbalized to the others, I ah, oh, the tree just said, <laughs> and um, and the other three people actually like kind of validated that. Oh, I I just had the same feeling, and so one of them uh, said like, well, why don't we do sit down and and sit with the tree? So we turned around and sat, and the four of us were sitting at the base of this gigantic, huge uh, tree, and uh, and as I sat there. Uh, I was like, okay, so what have you got for me? <laughs> uh, what is it that I'm here to learn and take away home message and all of that? And the tree was like, no, this time it's not for you to, to take, it's for you to give. And I was like, okay. And the way in which you give is just actually by sitting with me. And it's so simple. And, uh, and then the tree said, well, you know, 
I because this must be I I would say this is like a really really old tree, and uh, it's like I remember you a lot. You know, I remember you your your kind coming and sitting under me under my shade. I remember the the, the children's laughing. I remember the women weaving. I remember you, and I was like, huh, and uh, and it was like, and then then you went away for a while. And, uh, but now I'm so glad that you're back. And, um, well, the, the, the gap that seems such a little minor detail in the lifetime of a tree of this kind is actually a 20,000 years old cap for us. Um, this is a site that is actually protected as well by the UNESCO because uh, uh, there were lakes there and well, 20,000 years old. And uh, there are no lakes anymore. There is no, there hasn't been anybody living there for 20,000 years. And, and yet the tree recognized us immediately. Uh, and it was just like, oh, it's good to have you back. <laughs> and um, this experience was shared. So I wasn't the only one that we were sitting in silence, but the four of us had a very similar experience. So you might say that I'm crazy and I make up things. And yeah, that's highly possible. Actually, I'm pretty sure I am. But, uh, but uh, then we had a, a shared making up thing and we had a shared craziness. And, uh, and then we should also extend the craziness to all of the human humanity that has been before this time. Before this time, I mean, the last few hundred years, maybe the last thousand years which is actually nothing compared to 120,000 of habitation, for example, here in Australia. I don't even know if your mind can comprehend the number. Mine can't, I know that. Um, even thinking of 100 years is quite difficult. I know that 100 years ago, something happened and I come, obviously I'm European and I come from a country which has a long history, but the long history is like, uh, what? A couple of thousands of years. We're talking about 20,000, 60,000, 80,000, 120,000 years of memory, which is in the land, is in the trees, and it's in all of the others who live at the very different time scales and tell the stories in, using very different language that is not necessarily our human language, but the stories are there. And um, when I shared this with the elders that I was with, when I told them, oh, this would happen at the tree. And, uh, and they just smiled. And then they said, like, this is why we do ceremonies. And I was like, mm, OK. And uh, in particular, this area has been missing uh, one particular bird, which was uh, very much like iconic of that area. And, and they're like, yeah, that's why we do ceremonies, so that we can just call everyone back. The trees is happy that we are sitting under her, you know, canopy because she knows, she remembers that we were here and many others were here, not just humans. And then something happened and we went and, and the story goes that we went walk about and others came and following us and looking for us. And, and this particular bird like took it up on in itself to just find us. And uh, then we came back, now we are back and, and we are back in a very beautiful way, especially in this place. And, uh, and so we need to let the bird know that it's okay to come back, that everyone is back, everyone is waiting. So um, even this idea that, um, yeah, that, that we are misbehaving, I think, yes, we are, but also we already know how to do this. There is nothing that we need to discover. It just uh, literally is when we hear the call, we need to uh, acknowledge that we are hearing the call instead of pretending that the system that, uh, of thinking that we have uh, subscribed to um, would tell us that there is no call. What are you talking about? And uh, the calls are very clear and I'm almost certain that many of the people online right now uh, would have had these experiences before. So it's a matter of literally embodying them uh, again. 
the, the word seems to continue coming back, but embodying this, um, this uh, listening, this attending, this paying, paying attention. And uh, embodying means that uh, we uh, have to take care of the relationship. And really, at the end, that's all, you know, caring. Here we speak about caring for country, but country is not a place or a, a location. Country is a, a web of relationship. And so caring for country applies everywhere. <laughs> and because everything is country. And, um, and it doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter what you do. Uh, it just means like, uh, if you're going to be uh, here, then, you know, there are rules. You know, <laughs> this is the, a big house and it's got many people living here and people, I mean, all kinds, not just humans. And um, so, you know, there are rules so that we can live uh, respectfully and caring for each other. And so, but, and the, the thing is, it's not about us being the stewards or the guardian of the, of the place. Uh, for me, my understanding uh, from these experiences, especially thinking, you know, the, the others that I've worked with, is that um, it's not about taking care in the sense of like guarding. There's nothing to guard. Taking care means like take care of how you um, embody your purpose. The same way as the eucalyptus is embodying his purpose and his purpose at times is to drop the, the limbs. And so what are you doing as the human? And in, in the context of Australia, especially actually this site where the big tree was, um, one of the purposes is to look after the fire. And uh, without the humans, actually we have, without fire, cultural burning, which is the traditionally burning areas in a very cool controlled way, uh, which understand the interaction and the relationship and the conversation between different elements, whether it's the tree with a, of a particular species, uh, with the wind and the temperature and the, the time of the, of the season. And so understanding that there are all these relations which create this moment and, and you're part of it, you know? So what is your purpose in this moment? And um, I've, I was taken to see sites where there have been wildfires because there was no one caring. And then I've been, and it's total distraction. You know, it, it just, everything burns. And then I was shown site where cultural burning was implemented. And cultural burning is not like, so that we can control the place, but it's like, this is our purpose in this system. This is our job, the same way as, you know, uh, the ants take away the, the crumbs <laughs> or the, you know, the, the, the bees use the hole that um, was left by the eucalyptus dropping its branch so that they can make um, a nest and, and thrive there. Our role in this environment is, uh, yeah, you, you need to look after the house by burning it sometimes, burning it in the right way, in a way that is connected and appreciate and understand the relationships, which are gonna thrive if you do your job and they're not gonna thrive if you don't. So um, again, the understanding of this, uh, the understanding of uh, this interconnectedness is the, the only thing that really matters at the end. And, and language, um, it's beautiful. And in fact, I think through poetry and, and beautiful literary, literary writing, uh, we can be inspired, at least I should talk for myself, I feel inspired when, because sometimes the language that uh, I have is not good enough to express what needs to be said and, uh, and, and so these are beautiful ways that we have to express that. But also sometimes language is actually absolutely inadequate. And so we should just recognize that and there is nothing to say. We can be our purpose and we can be in place and be with others and listening without having to say anything all the time. <laughs> so um, yeah, Language doesn't necessarily need to change. It's just language is just a, a thing that we do. And, but uh, we can definitely um, choose how to use it. And uh, so in some context, you know, using the word use is appropriate too. We use fire so that we can keep country healthy. 
but the use is not a uh, uh, domineering colonial uh, perspective of you know relating the use is like oh i am the one the tool that is required for this to happen and so i'm gonna do my purpose i'm gonna embody my purpose and um in the project that i've been developing on the eucalyptus in particular we are actually looking uh, through the literature for this one particular species, the river red gum. And uh, we started, of course, from the scientific literature. And in the language, you can already see that the entire, um, all of the re re references that we have are talking about wood, uh, paper, uh, resource, uh, use, uh, and they're very much like utilitarian um, you know, connotations. And then we move to uh, the more subjective, and there is no subjective there. And then we move to the more subjective literature, uh, you know, in li liter literally in the literature um, of the humanities. And, and that's where we find, we start finding uh, a language that describe uh, the trees as a subject and agent and, and you know, others with, with their own story to tell. And the idea of this project in particular is to try and to find ways for those two languages to, to talk to each other and maybe something new to emerge. And in the context as well of how can we then embody these? So our per in our purpose, like how do we embody these? So that, for example, we might be able to revisit the language that we use in say legal context. So that we make laws and make legal tools that actually do allow us to create the right relationships. Because at the moment, the, at least in Australia, the legal tools that we have are just, again, they're, they're failing us because they are not, um, the language is not there to talk about these trees, for example, as actual people with rights. And, um, and again, even going back to uh, your beautiful uh, reading, Sarah, from the the elders is like, uh, but even the question of rights shouldn't be a question. Is like, of course, everyone's got rights. I mean, we are all here, right? And uh, so even that should be then ultimately transcended. It's like uh, nobody should be given rights because we already have them, and we should just acknowledge that and grow up. So, yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Monica. I think we we had so many questions related with this, but I think it's time for us to share um, a surprise for everyone. Uh, so my mom knew about this, um, and she she created a, a song. Um, she wrote it this morning, and she sang it this morning, and she recorded this morning. Um, so maybe I'll just give a little background of who she is and um, my teeth are all green. Um, so my mom, she, she has, she's a professional singer and her artistic practice, she goes a bit further than her part as a singer. She actually take into a self-observation of inside of her and the poetry that she writes uh, and sings, she does it intuitively. So, and she reflects what she's learning, uh, what is given to her by life and by nature. So I'll ask now Ekvenia to share something that somehow will connect what Monica was expressing. Okay, one second. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Let me just yes. the screen. And... You can hear?
Just wanted to thank Alessandra. I would like to thank Inesh for inviting her and for making this happen. It was recorded literally one or two days ago here in Portugal. Is that right? No, it was this morning. This morning, okay. Here we go. <laughs> she couldn't be with us. She's not here with us today, but uh, she's here with us uh, through her beautiful contribution that you heard earlier, through her poetry and through her song. And um, yeah, I just wanted to reflect a little bit further, going a little bit deeper. Um, it, it's a question to maybe not answer necessarily straight away, but to hold and to take away for all of us. Um, what is this common language that we have with the other? And where is that space and time where we can exercise this language? I don't like the word exercise, but um, use it. Uh, activated, um, yeah, and how deep we can go in with all of that. And as an artist, I'm personally incredibly interested in beyond the verbal communication. Um, and there are many forms, um, and these forms include uh, singing as well and listening to the song of the trees and other beings. Um, so thank you so much, Inesh, for, um, for creating this beautiful opportunity for us to hear Alexandra intervention. And I would love to ask a question that relates to the topic that 
I am incredibly passionate about and I have been personally researching for a long time is the question of time. And again, this is the question that I would, I would love to ask both Sarah and Monica. How do you feel our perception, our human perception of time actually affect our relationship with the other, with non-human? And how do you feel um, perhaps we could learn about time from the plants and the trees, from working with them, from collaborating with them, listening to them and talking to them? Well, you take this one first. Do you want to take this one first? No. <laughs> okay. Well, I think that we probably all would agree that we humans are speeding around faster and faster. Um, again, from one of the readings that I recently did, um, I came upon this. Uh, hypothesis or theory called technology induced environmental distancing. And I really love that. This is something that's been important to me for for many years, I, I purposely use my body. Uh, you know, a very simple example is taking the stairs instead of an elevator, in order to stay connected to my body, and that means more time. And I think knowing through our body is um, a really important part of being a part of nature. And sitting initially, if we've been speeding around, well, Monica sort of spoke to this when you said, I'm a busy human. I don't have time to sit <laughs> underneath a tree. Um, but that's just so imperative that we do that because when we're speeding through our own lives, we're not connected with our own lives and we're not connected to life on the planet with us. Um, and as I was thinking of this, you know, we just have this um, idea, I think, that plants are moving slowly because we can't see their movements unless it's a very fast moving plant, um, like a plant that catches insects for ingestion. Um, but it doesn't mean they're slow. And Monica can probably speak to in, in more detail about this than I can, but plants can um, respond to stimuli from the outside in less than a second. Um, so they have a very fast internal life. And when I think about Trees, people say, oh, trees are slow. How can a tree be slow? I mean, a tree has so much that it has to pay attention to and that's going on inside and outside. I think you have to be pretty fast in a way. <laughs> um, about, yeah. And I, um, I wanna share something that um, I really loved from, from, my, from my interviews. I interviewed Paco Calvo who's a Spanish uh, philosopher of plant science. And I know Monica, you know Paco. Um, and um, we were talking about time-lapse photography and I'm gonna read a, a, a passage here that's a combination of my writing um, to sort of condense what he said. So it has some of his quotes in it. And it's that at the, the technique of animation of time-lapse photography can be misleading because it is, and I'll do this every time he's speaking, it is so intuitive, so impressive, so powerful. When we see three or four days of condensed plant beh behavior play out over a few minutes, it's easy to think that's what's actually happening. There are gaps between picture and picture that can last between five and 10 minutes, right? So we don't see those. Since we cannot see what is happening within those gaps, we might be deluding ourselves into seeing more than is actually there. So because Paco realized this, he turned to a method that Darwin actually developed for himself, which is a method of endurance and patience to directly observe plant behavior because Paco wanted to get himself down into the plant's pace um, in order to move into their time window to see the way a plant moves an inch every half an hour. Um, and that, and he also in our interview talked about, you know, how's that for meditation? And I, I, I you know, that's, that's sort of meditation, um, but I think um, it does bring us down into a, a meditative state and a meditative experience of time. Um, yeah, so those are some of my 
some of my thoughts on plants and time. Monica? Yeah, I know, I know very well Paco and uh, I'm not surprised that that would be his quote. Um, interestingly enough, um, you know, even despite this kind of approach, uh, here is an, a good example of a, a brilliant mind still wanting to explain. And the problem with time is that uh, it is a totally mind concept. But the very moment you are trying to explain time, you are already cutting off any possibility to enter a different time. Um, because the other different time doesn't actually exist as well as our time doesn't really exist. Um, so to enter the plant time, it means to exit time, not to enter. And, um, and so any effort to trying to slow us down to the time of dot, 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 is actually still a very uh, human approach, of course, because that's who we are, uh, but it, it, it kind of, it kind of still uh, suggests to me, and this is, I'm just speaking from my experience, because I've done this, uh, you know, it's still the me that wants to control time. And so it's like, okay, I'll slow down for you, but it, I am slowing down. So I have a reference point where time actually is in, is the right time, which is my human time. And then I'm slowing down for you so that you can maybe show yourself <laughs> as the planned time. And, uh, but the, the experience that I've actually had when I have been able to be with the plants is out of time. And so suddenly I, uh, I could have been there for days or five minutes or three seconds, and I really don't know. And, uh, and when those experiences uh, take place, then yeah, it's, it is a meditation because uh, you're transcending something. And, um, and in this sense, you're transcending the, the boundary that time imposes so that you can only perceive uh, X um, amount of signals per second. It's like, what is that? There are signals going on all the time. And we're perceiving everything all the time. It's just that we're paying attention to some more than others. And uh, so again, to me, the question of time is actually a question of attention. And, uh, and again, I would like to also quote someone else who put it very beautifully because I think she captures exactly uh, what time for me is. She says, this is Mary Oliver. Uh, so poet and writers, a US writer, beautiful. And, um, and in one of her essays, she literally just finished the essay saying, attention is the, um, is basically the first step, is the, the way to get to devotion. And, uh, and that's what really is required um, to, to connect with the other. It's not about slowing down or speeding up or capturing them. In, on camera, I mean, like, yes, that's, a, that's all good. And that's a very scientific approach still, um, which actually is not that much different from what we've been doing all, the, all along. <laughs> We're capturing others instead of freeing them to be what they need to be. And that means that we free as well the human that can be what it needs to be instead of having to be in a particular way. And so to bring attention so that you can move into a space where there is devotion, like you're devoting your attention to something and someone, and you are open so that you're allowing that. Imagine when you are really devoted to someone. First of all, devotion and love come very close to each other for me. And so if there is devotion, you're, you put your love into that listening, and it's a deep listening because of that. And so, then time, you know, thinking like, okay, I've got five minutes. As long as you tell me everything now, in five minutes, I'll be good. It's like uh, it, it, time becomes a, no longer a question. I'm not trying to capture you. I'm not trying to uh, constrain you. I'm trying to learn how to listen so that I can meet you. And I think devotion allows for that meeting to occur, which again, it goes back to like, how do we engage in this conversation? How do we engage in this consultation? I think then we use, you know, our time 
to uh, give a shape to what we have learned. But the learning itself, the connection itself is not about time. And, um, and you know, as the big tree that I was mentioning before, uh, so like, I've been here for a long while and you were here, then you were gone, then you're back. It's like 20,000 years. It's like, that's the gap that he's mentioning. It's like, well, I think that the tree uh, is, uh, is going a long way. And we are more like a little butterfly that's got one day to live. And we think that everything happens in that one day. It's like, so again, the, the concept of time is, um, it's a bit weird. And we think we're going so fast, but actually uh, maybe we are pretty slow compared to a butterfly. <laughs> and, uh, and we are going fast compared to, you know, uh, a tree. But again, th that doesn't, time and uh, entering different times doesn't actually help us to connect, I don't think. For me, it's like, you need to get out of time. So where time is no longer the reference point. And then you are exactly in the same place as everyone else. And in that place, not only you are exactly in the same place, so you're sharing this, but it, there's something more that happens in, in, in that by uh, getting out of time, out of the reference point that time imposes. Um, again, just talking about from, from my experience, both as a scientist and as my personal self, uh, if that even makes sense. But um, yeah, getting out of time means that not only you realize that there is a space where, that we share, but the, the extra step is that you are the other, that you think you're sharing with and you are the space itself that you think you're sharing within. And that's why time is a funny construct because it allows us to think and to believe that we are separate entities. And it's a good reference point because um, it works. <laughs> it works and it's like, oh, you know, and you look at all the political agendas, they're very short term. Of course, because uh, in, with a reference point of time, then you can construct things, but actually they make no sense because there is no such a thing as a short term. What is that like? A, oh, I've got like a one year term. It's like, what, what does that mean? It's like, so then you actually uh, like lose all responsibilities and you're actually no longer here after that. Like you're still here and you are responsible, not because other humans tell you that you're responsible, but because you are here and, um, so yeah, I, I have an issue with time, I think. <laughs> but um, as I've been engaging into the experiments in, in a slightly different way than I was trained to do, still applying, of course, the scientific method, but using different, a different approach that I think is just emerging. I don't even know how to describe it really, but for allowing the space to be free of time as much as I am capable of. And then really see what it is that is required. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm learning a lot from that. And I think it will be a very useful thing for, uh, for humanity to, to engage with. Because then also the time critical things can be resolved because you have the clarity for it. And um, without, without that, we are just, um, you know, constrained in a particular time frame, and the mind freaks out when it's supposed to come up with an idea like yesterday, and uh, so and that doesn't help because it put us it put us all in a in a situation where we feel we are powerless, and it's not true. So, yeah. thank you, Monica and Sarah. Um, we are, oh, it's almost nine here, so we have 30 minutes more. So before we open up to everyone to ask any questions or any reflection about what we've been doing here, I would like to ask just one more short question to both of you. Um, and is um, in a very simple way and practical uh, way, how could we use if we want to approach a tree, what can we do? Do you want to speak or give me the hand motion, Monica? <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I, when I think about that question, I think about 
ethics, remembering we're in relationship and um, approaching a tree with great respect and um, asking to connect with it. I think of how in our culture, it's rude to go up to somebody who looks interesting and rub your hands all over them. <laughs> um, so I think we need to be mindful of not doing that with, um, with trees. And it doesn't mean actually that to connect with a tree, you have to touch it. You are um, connecting with it just by being near it. It's also extremely intelligent, so it can sense us. Um, some people like to stand back and just kind of connect through the tree's roots. Um, yeah, and going with an open heart, opening the space, uh, clearing the mind. Um, and I loved what Monica, you brought into this conversation about the tree saying it's fine to just sit because we feel like we have to do something all the time. And it's also a practice too. Um, some people can just naturally hear a lot of um, messages or communications from the tree, but to know that it's a practice if it's new to you and to know that there's different ways that the tree, a tree will communicate and it'll communicate through your individual um, bio sense, bio sense, yeah, and different overlapping um, uh, perceptions as well. So there could be, you, you might be someone who hears it literally or sees the language or set, smells or just senses it energetically, but also there can be a combination of those things happening at once too. So alerting, opening our fields to, um, to be in awareness and allowance. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, I, of course, I agree with everything you shared. Um, I guess there is uh, one thing that is coming to mind, and I, and I think that many of us do it naturally anyway especially with big trees, but we do it in many other situations. And when we are meeting someone, uh, especially someone new, that we really are interested in knowing more and, and getting closer to, um, we often, well, at least I do, uh, we take this big, deep breath. And it's like, hmm. And, uh, and, you know, it's almost like we're trying to breathe in the other. And I think we do. And, uh, and not only that, but as you take those kind of breaths, they, they're like, you breathe it in, and then it goes straight through your heart. And then sometimes if you're doing it really good, it goes down into your belly. And, uh, and you, I usually take a few of those. And then it's like, okay, now I'm really here. And, um, and I think that's how we actually connect in general with people like human people as well so trees are no different the the major difference with trees is that in that moment which is every moment for us um, we are literally bringing the tree in through the air that it was gifted to us and uh, so it's almost again it's almost again like a matter of attention and uh, to realize that every single breath was given to us by, by trees uh, who are very generous because they don't know you, but they're still, you know, giving you the oxygen. And um, I think that in itself already highlight that you are in communion regardless of your awareness and you are already there and you're already communicating in, in a way relating and talking uh, without you even having to do it consciously. So it's just a matter of like uh, taking those breaths consciously. And then you're like, hmm, yeah, hello. <laughs> and, um, and then I think the rest kind of seems to just happen. You know, sometimes it is, sometimes like with people, like human people, it's like, sometimes, you know, 
some people are just not for you. <laughs> you don't have to talk to everyone. Like, can you imagine? It's like, you know, just leave some alone. It, it's okay. And, and some don't want to talk to you. Like, you know, maybe you don't smell right. You know, we do that with other humans. So it's like, why shouldn't we expect this kind of um, relating to occur in other places? And I, I mean, I love dogs, for example, but some dogs, when they're really stinky, I just cannot, I cannot do it. <laughs> and um and other dogs, they just smell so beautiful. And I, I'm ready to pat them and I'm happy for them to lick my face, even if I don't know them. And so I think that um, for me, you know, the, the, that first step of like, you're actually breathing the other in, it's already putting you in relationship. And then bringing attention to that breathing allows you to then connect with all of the other steps that Sarah you highlighted very well and so it was like it actually it is literally a no-brainer like forget about your brain forget about trying to make sense of it forget about trying trying there's nothing to try just breathe and you're there and uh, but, but being you're there and we do this with humans so why shouldn't we do this Oh, well, we do this with everyone else. Why shouldn't we put the attention and the devotion into that as a practice, as Sarah was pointing out? So that when we approach a tree, instead of like going and touch it straight away, we breathe. And then in that moment, maybe the tree might say that doesn't want you to touch it. Can you honor that? And other times it's like, come close, sit under me. Can you honor that? Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Monica. I think I can relate um, deeply to breathing. There's been a lot of breathing since COVID started on Zoom as well. People meeting new people, uh, new collaborations forming, people exchanging wonderful ideas and things happen in virtual realm. Uh, but because we are very physical and we need that space together. I have participated in many situations when people just had to take this breather, take this moment and say, okay, let's just breathe together. And it feels good because this is what we do all the time. This is what makes us feel connected. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing it and yes it's wonderful to breathe together with humans and non-humans and be grateful for the ones who also provide us air to breathe and with this i would love to open to everyone else to our amazing participants who have been listening very attentively and deeply and at this point, please, you can ask any question to anyone uh, here, to all four of us. I know that uh, somebody already started writing questions. So I would love maybe somebody right now, uh, whoever really has a very burning question and who feels their heart is beating and they want to ask it, just unmute yourself and just ask this first question. Can I ask a very practical question, please? Did you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, I, I um, live in and own, in inverted commas, a, a, a woodland, which, which was originally an ancient woodland, but now is a plantation. And it's been used as a resource for centuries with coppicing hornbeam, for example, for the London bread markets, bread ovens. And my, my question is, um, in order to make it more natural, um, I basically have to brutalize it with a, a chainsaw. I have to thin the oaks to allow other species to grow. I have to coppice the hornbeam in order to allow the oaks to um, develop naturally. If I don't do that, um, certain species will, will die. And yet I'm, I'm very well aware that if I use a chainsaw, I am of course causing harm and hurt. So how do I reconcile everything that, that people have dis discussed this evening with the practical management or care for a woodland? Um, how, how do I reconcile the two? Because I find that 
really very difficult. Did you did you did you hear that? I would like to ask yes. Monica and Sarah that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would like to answer that. Um, or oh, start to answer that. <laughs> Uh, it reminds me of, uh, first of all, thank you, Simon, and it's nice to, to meet you. Um, hello, first hello. of all, yeah. <laughs> this reminds me of uh, the, same, um, the same thing that we were discussing before in relation to fire. And, uh, you know, like, from my, one perspective, a very Western perspective, uh, and that's what happened. It's like, uh, oh, don't don't touch anything. Don't burn anything. No, 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 no. You're gonna hurt. You're gonna, you know, this is not right. You just nature is about living it on its own without us. That's nature. That's the pristine environment. And then we are the polluting other that actually ruins everything. And so, like, just uh, let's lock up some nature over there in the national park. Let's not touch it, and the rest will be fine. And uh, well, if you take as an example, um, many places in Australia, that has been disastrous. And actually we have lost just last year, right where I live, uh, we have lost a lot of national park. Exactly for that reason, because burning and fire are part of the, fire is, a part, is an agent, is one of the people that lives in this land. Yeah. And so without fire, the land doesn't thrive, the land dies. And more, more die, more species die because of not caring and not understanding the place. So I guess in the context of what you're describing, I feel like your chainsaw is what um, an uncle that lives here, an Aboriginal man that lives with us would say, this is, let, let's use black fella magic. <laughs> this is black fella magic, it's like a fire, is the you know the black fellow magic, but the chainsaw is just the new version of the same concept. It's like uh, it, you by caring part of your purpose of being part of this community is to make sure that you know you clean up where where, you need, where is needed so that other many others can thrive. And um, and one of the things that one of the elders said to me is like uh, caring for country, so caring for a woodland, for example. It's, um, it's really about making sure that um, you keep all the voices uh, open. So the idea is not that there will be all, the, all your oaks are, are thriving, but everyone else is not because uh, you didn't cut them down. Um, I think that the, the, the point is like, uh, and this is how nature does it anyway. And we know this from Darwin, from natural selection, it needs diversity, it needs variation. Without that, you cannot have uh, life. It cannot select anything, it cannot move, evolution doesn't work. So nature makes sure that we have diversity and that's why sometimes it does it in very drastic ways where we have make everything uniform, like uh, as a plantation where we put things and we, we clear things and then we put one species in there and we make sure that that one species is doing well. And then after a few years, it just doesn't do well anymore. Yeah. Of course, because that's, that's not how nature operates. So in your case, I feel like your woodland is uh, really inviting you to be part of this. And your, your being part of this is use the chainsaw. But that's the thing I can feel already okay. from your description is like you're not just going around and just chainsawing everything because you're having fun. And I know some people yeah. do that. <laughs> uh, you're doing it because that's part of your purpose or as part of this network of beings that you're sharing with. And I find that that's really beautiful. And I'm pretty sure that the forest as a collective, so the community of trees that are living with you um, are very well aware of that. The same way as they're aware that when fire comes, if it's done in a cultural way, fire is good. And yes, some of the plants need to burn, but that is kind of, is their purpose. And, uh, but they're also good medicine. So it's uh, about giving space for all the voices to be heard. Sarah maybe has more in a different take, but. Well, no, I'm so glad that you, that you took that, Monica, because I feel that you can speak to it more than I can. And I know Simon, and I know that this has been plaguing you for a while. Um, 
And just at the end of what you were saying, Monica, I was thinking again about the eucalyptus dropping its limbs and letting go. And we're just so hung up about so much attachment. And I think that that hanging up keeps us attached to this particular way of being in life that grabs on to life and kills it actually, <laughs> because um, we need to, I think, pull back and understand that we are in the cycle too. And that the, the forest is like incredibly aware of that um, and to kind of tune into letting go of our, de of our ideas in order to move in the ways that Monica, you just described with, um, with the forest and, and bringing some of those practices in just to sit and be open with, um, you know, the beings that are in the community around your house so that perhaps they might give you some guidance. Like Monica was just saying at the top of our talk about how they actually are, the humans are making some changes on the land because the non-humans that live there know what needs to be there and that, that needs to be done because because it's their, it's their community. And actually this does remind me of something that I really took away from my talks with a lot of people who communicate with trees and that's that the trees wanna collaborate, right? So get out there, Simon. <laughs> all right, all right. But the thing is the ones that get chopped down don't perhaps appreciate the collaboration, but that, but, that is really, really helpful. I think. But don't forget that you, you're not gonna go up just surprise that tree with the chainsaw, right? You're gonna have a conversation with it and you're gonna let it know and you maybe it might have some ideas for you. That's another thing that came through too is that when we're communicating with trees, if they say something that we never would have thought of ourselves, that's a really good sign that it's not coming from ourselves. I um, just, I remember I was very nervous before this talk that I gave and I was, um, going and speaking with all the trees. And I came, I started with the first one who's the more, who's quite social. And I was just thinking, oh my God, I'm so nervous. I'm so nervous. And I heard this, well, you're not dead yet. <laughs> no, he didn't say yet, he's like, you're not dead. You know, like, of course you're gonna be nervous. <laughs> um, so yeah, hopefully you start to talk to everybody and also pay attention to your dreams too. Mm -hmm. And if I might add on that, um, I actually was asked by a tree in my garden, a tree that I loved very much, to cut it down. And I was like, no, I'm not doing that. This was an acacia tree. And then I was like, no, no, no. And so a few months passed and the tree again, so like, you gotta cut me down. And I was like, no, 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 I'm listening wrong. <laughs> this is not happening, <laughs> you know, this is bad. And, um, and then eventually one day I was uh, collecting all these leaves that they were dropping down on, on, at the feet of this tree. And I was like, wow, thank you, thank you. First, I was like, oh, thank you for dropping your leaves. I'm collecting them. I see that you want me to pick them up. And I was like, and then there were a bit too many leaves dropping. And then I looked closer and closer and the tree was being attacked by borers. And I think that if I had cut it down when he asked me to, it would have regenerated. And instead, I decided that I was being too good. I decided what was needed. And I actually didn't do my purpose. My purpose was to cut it down at the right time when the tree knew it was the right time so that it would have a chance to regenerate. And instead, by that stage, it was, we had to cut it down. Otherwise, the, that uh, border might, cut, uh, might cull all the other trees. Uh, but it was too late for that one. So again i think that we have it's a very uh, anthropocentric way of thinking that our action are either uh, you know of a certain kind of the good action and on a certain kind of the bad actions it's like we just need to do what is required at the right time and uh, and to know that we need to listen and for me to hear you speaking about uh, you know, I had to cut this, uh, I had to cut some of these trees down so that there is space for other species and other, tr other plants to thrive. I am almost certain that all of those involved in that community know that you're totally part of that 
and they kind of like, oh, good, Simon is coming to give us a haircut now. Excellent. We really need it. Otherwise, here everyone is choking. So um, to, for you to see yourself as part of it, it means that sometimes you are doing the haircut. If you didn't, you probably find that your plants would start dying, as Sarah pointed out. And because oh, they, we they are, are not, they are. They are. there you go. And there's a thing because again, we are not uh, this uh, kind of external element that imposes. We have done that, we can do that, but it, it, we can only do that if we believe that we are the external element that imposes. And that's what really colonialism is all about. <laughs> but, uh, and it's done really well and it has reincarnated itself over centuries. So we are really comfortable with that uh, style of approach. But, um, you know, we are, regardless of what we believe, we are part of this system. And so it's just a choice of how we're gonna be part of this system. And, uh, and all of these others, plants, animals, are just really constantly, I, I'm, I'm outstanding by the patients. They're constantly like, all right, let's try again with these ones because they didn't get it. So I think you're doing a beautiful job. Just use the white fella magic, the chainsaw. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Let someone else ask a question. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> much appreciated. Thank you, Simon, for asking the question. And thank you, Sarah and Monica, for answering. We have really little time left because I don't like going so much of a time. We can stay like five minutes long, but not too long. But I would actually love to ask you everyone, because of course we can't receive questions from everybody. Type your question in the chat and the question goes to everybody and everybody can reflect after and can think further and reconnect with that question and meditate. And so like write everything you feel like you want to ask or communicate um there and i would love to ask if actually sarah or monica have a, has a question to ourselves or to each other maybe we'll let them ask a question instead as a kind of closing of this conversation if you have if not then you could pass it on to somebody else but like a really short one <laughs> monica do you have a question or oh, sarah you need to unmute I am yourself. thinking. <laughs> okay. Somebody has a really short question, meanwhile, to any one of us, please. Now is the moment. Okay, so there is a question from Jess. While everybody's thinking, I will pick it up and how does your communication with plants affect your communication with other non-human beings? Does anybody, does anybody relate to that? Does anybody have a short experience to share? If I might, uh, for me, it's just, uh, sorry, Sai, did you wanna go? <laughs> Um, for me, it's like uh, what I've learned with the plants it just showed me uh, more about what I am as this incarnation of, uh, in the form of a human being. And, um, and so it just the realization that um, I could be a plant anytime. <laughs> So I could be any other non-human anytime too. It just uh, really doesn't matter. It just happens that I'm in this form, but it, I could be anything. Well, I am everything. And this is not like uh, I'm a megalomaniac, but it's just uh, a much deeper realization. So even the communication, with, even the, the words non-human other, become quite irrelevant. It's like, there is no such a thing. There is no other. So of course it, it, it affects my communication more and more with all the, these others, but by realizing that there actually, there are no others and whatever I do to others is actually done to the self and there is only the self. So that's all I have to worry about if that's the right word even. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, listening to you, Monica. Um, can I say something? Yeah. Somebody just jumped in. Um, um, thank you to everybody. Um, Inesh, I think you are trying to say something, Inesh Amado, but we can't hear you so well. So try to, 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 to switch your video off. Maybe the voice will be better. No. Okay. Okay. Um, I just want to, um, to say something in relation to what uh, Monica has um, just said, and that is I actually feel that to my language, the Inesh, we cannot hear you. Can anybody hear Inesh? I cannot hear her. So Inesh, maybe maybe write write in the chat instead. If you don't mind. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, we are a lot of people and um, I Can just, I, yeah, Sarah, I just, please go on. I, I just, I'm really appreciating Sean's comment in the chat. Um, it's so wonderful to be in a conversation where everyone is essentially on the same page. Um, where we don't have to worry that people are going to think we're nuts, as, as Sean is saying. Um, I, uh, a, f a friend of mine just uh, uh, shared with my class that I was teaching the other night. Um, when there's people around her who potentially think she's nuts or want to argue, she says, you know, I, dis I disrespectfully don't care what you think. <laughs> it's just it's we can't get hung up I think in what other people think of us because that's we're holding ourselves back and in holding ourselves back we're continuing to hold back this forward movement I think that we need to have these connections and and plug into the memories of these of these conversations um but I just wanted to um follow on what Monica was saying in response to the question um which I'm forgetting what the question was oh, oh communicating with um plants and how that extends to non-humans. I would even say that the more that um, as I move through my own life and become more aware, I'm not even sure that are my thoughts, are my ideas mine? What is the self? I mean, we're just, I think we are being affected by a lot of beings that we can see and we can't see constantly. And um, we're constantly in a, in a motion uh, that's that's changing and that, you know, it's a big conversation, but um, I think that's how I am affected. Um, and yeah, it does everybody, every, everyone, every, everyone can talk. <laughs> okay, I will turn off my mic. Mm, Sarah, thank you so much for sharing this. I feel like it opens a whole, uh, big other question about the question of self and identity and yeah it's it's huge it's like opening a pandora box i feel but it's incredibly important to reflect on that and it's incredibly incredibly important to reflect personally and in community and in human community and in community where include the others into that circle and this is what I feel with the project Say My Name and I will tell you my story we are doing. And I just wanted to say thank you everybody for participation. And this is not the end, this is just the beginning. This is a multi-phase project, we are hoping so. It's an international project. This is a little secret that's going out in the world. And we would love to stay connected. We would love to follow your work, all of you here in this room. We would love you to keep sharing. So keep sharing on the chat while we're still online. I'm going to post right now a link for the rest of the conversations. It's the same link. It's the same event, bright link. So please 
sign up and also share, spread the message, give it to your friends. And also there are two links for Sarah Project and for my own website, which you can sign up for and you will receive news and messages about how the project evolves and continues. The next two conversations that we are going to have is the 3rd of November. And it is going to be about the subject is eucalyptus indigenous knowledge. So we are going to have with us Dr. Philip Clark and perhaps someone else participating, which will be a surprise appearance if this happens. It will be at 10 o'clock in the morning Lisbon time because uh, Philip is based in Australia. And another conversation will be on the 5th of November, five o'clock Lisbon time about intangible heritage and intangible values of forest, which is the subject that is incredibly dear to my heart because of the work on eternal forest sanctuaries and because of this particular project that we are developing now. So please join us. Um, we are going to we are going to save everything. We're going to save the talk. We're going to save the chat. We're going to send you all this information. So you will receive all this amazing collection of questions, responses, links. And of course we are staying connected. And I would love to thank our beautiful speakers. I'm incredibly grateful from my personal self, from the family of all eucalyptus trees that are present here with us. I know they're listening with their special ears. I would like to thank Monica and Sarah. I would like to thank Inesh for jumping on board of this incredibly crazy journey and Sarah project. And maybe I will uh, close off my microphone and maybe let Inesh say the very last final word if she wants. I think you said everything. You introduced what is going to happen next. You already said thank you for everyone that was here. I'm very grateful and honored that Sarah and Monica accept this challenge of speaking and sharing their knowledge with all of us. And I hope you guys can continue to be engaged with our project. This is going to happen at least for upcoming I don't know, two years. Um, so this is just really the beginning of something. So thank you all for being here. It's totally great to just watch people flash off. That was, that's, I've never done that before. And that's probably, nice. Yeah. <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder if that's how it is 
in a way how the trees might experience humans you know flashing in and out of <laughs> <laughs> and some people probably still have us on their devices and may not realize it mm. they are waiting for the after party to happen oh. <laughs> The after party for me is like, uh, I'm going to start my day. The sun is up. The sun is up. You're, gonna, you're going to go say hello to the eucalyptus tree. Please uh, say yeah. our huge gratitude and mm. love and thanks to this tree for participating. I know they participate. I know they're here. He already knows. He already knows. I can see him from here. <laughs> so... Thank you so much for having me. It was beautiful. Mm. I totally agree. It was such a pleasure and a gift to be with you all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so beautiful to meet you, Sarah. Thank you. You too, Monica. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I really, I just loved listening to you, what you had to say. Thanks. Same here. <laughs> okay. Thank Take you. Take care, everybody. Take care. And have a lovely evening. Uh, the continuation of your day and we talk soon yes <laughs> much care. gratitude thanks yeah. ciao, ciao. ciao. <laughs> bye bye thank you